فاشرف بي لاشتغال بالعلم ولا تبغي به ما عشت يا ذا بدلا ويا له من شرف عظيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله أما بعد uh, we have received some emails which are pertaining to the issue of Ramadan and inshallah we'll be going to answer as much as we can I am with Ustad Abdurrahman Hassan and uh, inshallah our first question is going to be I'm a sister who knows when her menses starts and finishes precisely so if, if I know that I'm going to be pure that day after Fajr do I fast that particular day and if I did fast previously was my fast valid and if I didn't fast, am I sinning? Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Wal'aqibatu lil muttaqeen wa la udwana illa ala al-zalimeen Wa usalli wa usallimu ala man arsalahu Allahu rahmatan lil alameen Sayyidina wa nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabih wa attabi'ina lahum bi ihsanin ila yawmi al-deen amma ba'd This particular sister's question it shows that she's understood the hadith of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam in which the Prophet says in the hadith of Hafsa radiyallahu ta'ala anha مَن لَمْ يُجْمِعُ الصِّيَامَ قَبْلَ الْفَجْرِ فَلَا صِيَامَ لَهُ That the person who doesn't come with an, an intention before Fajr then verily that person doesn't have a fast. So this particular hadith is an evidence that it's obligatory on each and every one of us to have an intention for Fajr, uh, sorry, before Fajr, for that particular day. So this sister, since she's on her menstruation, since she's, she's on her menstruation, and this intention, she can't come with it, as she is not yet under any takalif, she's not mukallaf, she's not burdened, to come with an intention since she's on her menstruation and her menstruation finishes after Fajr so she's not able to come with an intention and she's not able to follow the statement of the Prophet the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam مَن لَمْ يُجْمِعُ الصِّيَامَ قَبْلَ الْفَجْرِ فَلَا صِيَامَ لَهُ and this hadith shows that it's obligatory for her to come with an intention so the scholars here they say that she enters onto the general principle which is known as لا تكليف إلا بمستطاع which is derived and taken from the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها that Allah does not burden a soul more than that which it that more than that which it could carry or more than that which it could do so you're not burdened if you don't have the ability and she's an exception of this particular hadith of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam مَن لَمْ يُجْمِعُ الصِّيَامَ قَبْلَ الْفَجْرِ فَلَا صِيَامَ لَهُ She is an istithna, she is an exception and her fasting is correct if she does fast and it is not then upon her to bring back that fasting because the intention is only required from a person who is not on her menstruation so even if she did come with the uh, intention, it wouldn't have counted because she's a, she's on her menstruation. So, but she fasts uh, that particular day, and even if it's within the daytime, she realizes. She realizes that she has to fast. She's like the sabi, the child who reaches age of puberty in the daytime. Or the one who is insane who becomes sane in the day. Or the disbeliever who becomes a believer. He has to withhold from his fasting. And based on the hadith of Salamat ibn al-Aqwa radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, which is in Sahih al-Bukhari and Muslim, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is said, Amara rajulan, and the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Amara rajulan, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam commanded a man, he said to him, Adhin fi nasi, call the people and make, make sure they gather together. And the Prophet said, Man kana akala fal yasum baqiyata yawmihi. The one from amongst you who ate 
then let him fast the remaining of the day. وَمَنْ لَمْ يَكُنْ أَكَلَ فَلْيَصُمْ And the one who never ate should also fast. And also the hadith of Rubayy' bint Mu'awwid. رضي الله تعالى عنها what did she say? She said أرسل النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم غدأت عشراء And this time عشراء was obligatory. So the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم he sent somebody in the قرى الأمصار villages of Amsar. And the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم the command he gave was what? من أصبح مفطرا Any one of you who was not fasting فليتم بقية يومه he should fast the remaining of that day. ومن أصبح صائما and whoever was fasting that day فليصوم you should carry on fasting. And Rubayy bint Mu'awwid she said فكنا نصومه بعد we used to fast Ashura from that particular day onwards. ونصوم صبياننا and we will make our children also fast. ونجعل لهم اللعبة من العهن فإذا بكى أحدهم على الطعام أعطينا ذاك حتى يكون عند الإفطار. And we would make our children a toys. We'd make them play with it. And if it, and if they cried, then we would give them food uh, until iftar. So this is what uh, the response to the question uh, of the sister. Now. The second question is, every, every Ramadan here in the United Kingdom, the 18 degree prayer time issue comes up and some people favor one view over the, another. So based on what, so based on that, you find some people who are fasting and others who haven't yet broken their fast. What should one do and how do we deal with the matter? Um, what is necessary here right now is that we divide between the fasting of Ramadan and the fasting of other than Ramadan. The fasting is two types. A fasting which is congregational fasting. So it's an obligatory congregational fasting. And what I mean by obligatory congregational fasting is that you're not doing it by yourself. Everyone else in the, universe, in the world today is fasting when Ramadan enters. Okay, we're all fasting in Ramadan. There's no, everybody is fasting. It's something that everyone has to do. And it's obligatory. That's one. And there's another type of fasting which is individual voluntary fasting which is that everybody's doing it alone the overwhelming majority of people are not doing it with you and that's like the fasting of what Mondays and Thursdays or like the fasting of Dawood he used to fast one day and he would miss another day so um, or for example the fasting of Shawwal not every single person fasts the first 10 days of Shawwal some people are fasting the last 10 days of Shawwal. Some are fasting the middle 10 days of Shawwal. Not everybody are in, in, in line with one another. But Ramadan in the world, everybody fasts together. Maybe they start before each other and after each other. But the point is that there's a point where everybody has to fast with each other. So the fasting, which is a siyam, which is wajib, that's obligatory, and is jama'i, meaning it is congregational. This one, it is upon every Muslim to fast and to also break their fast with the jama'atun nas, to be the people. You have to break it with the people. If you're under a Muslim leader, then you should break it with the Muslim leader. And this is based on the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As-sawmu yawma tasawmuna wal-fitru yawma tuftiruna wal-adha yawma tudahhuna. That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, after fasting is the day you fast. And the breaking of the fast is the day which you break the fast. You break the fast. And the adha is the day you guys do the udhiya. So it's clearly the Prophet ﷺ clearly is ob commanding and it's showing that it's obligatory that the fasting and also the iftar, the breaking of the fast and also the udhiya. All of this has to be ma'al jama'ah together. And with the people. And also, um, this is something that shows the unification and that the Muslims are together 
And this is something that Sharia يرغب, it urges the believers to come with, which is to be together and to do things together. And this is my beloved brothers and sisters. Um, this is جمع لكلمة الأمة. It is bringing the, the voices and the people together. وتوحيدا لصفوفهم. And it's bringing their lines together. And it is also distancing them from what? Having individual opinions. Because as we know, فَإِنَّ, فَإِنَّ يَدُ اللَّهِ مَعَ الْجَمَاعَةِ Allah's hand is with the jama'ah. So based on that hadith and based on the issue of being united, both of them together, that's what should be done when the fasting is a obligatory, when it is a obligatory fasting and it's a co- co- obligatory which is a congregational fasting. Okay? The second fasting is the fasting which is voluntary and it's individuals. Everyone's doing it on their own. You're fasting on a Mondays and Thursdays. Not everybody's fasting with you. Okay? This now is all dependent on you. Since you're doing it by yourself, it's dependent on you. If you are of the opinion of the 18 degree calculation, if you're not of the view of the 18 degree calculation, and if you are of the opinion of following these calendars, and if you're not of the opinion of following these calendars and you cite it yourself, are you with me? Then at this particular moment, you are allowed to follow what you personally have with your knowledge. Of course, you have to have knowledge. And this is based on the statement of Allah, وَكُلُوا وَشَرَبُوا حَتَّى يَتَبَيَّنَ لَكُمُ الْخَيْطُ الْأَبْيَضُ مِنَ الْخَيْطِ الْأَسْوَدِ مِنَ الْفَجْرِ Allah tells us to eat, Allah tells us to drink, until the black rope becomes clear from the white rope. Okay? So this is your own observation. Also, the Prophet ﷺ says, إِذَا أَقْبَلَ اللَّيْلُ مِنْ هَاهُنَا وَأَدْبَرَ النَّهَارُ مِنْ هَاهُنَا وغرب وغر وَغَرَبَتِ الشَّمْسُ فَقَدْ أَفْطَرَ الصَّائِمُ That if the night comes from here and the day starts to leave and wear off and the sun sets, then the fasting person has broken his fast. So if you're saying that now I'm going to follow how the Prophet mentioned it, are you with me? This is not, these narrations are implemented on the basis of what? When the fasting is a fasting which is tatawwah or voluntary. And also if the fasting is obligatory such as fasting which is nether, you've made that fasting obligatory on yourself by making an oath but you're doing it on yourself, by yourself. It also falls under the second type that I'm speaking about. It all falls under the second part. So that is how to also reconcile between the Prophet's statements, alayhi salatu wasalam, and also how to de- deal with this issue that comes up every year uh, and what's to be done. Now. The third question is, I'm a brother who owns a restaurant here in Birmingham. And I work there even in the month of Ramadan. Sometimes non-Muslims and even Muslims come to my restaurant who aren't fasting. And I know the Muslims who come, some of them are not sick, nor do they have any justified legal Islamic reasoning. What do I do in this particular situation? It is not permissible for any individual um, to aid and to help somebody in the disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anyone who is obligatory on them to fast in the month of Ramadan. And the people who Ramadan is obligatory are on two. The believers. The fasting on the believers is obligatory asalatan by default. And... It's also obligatory on the disbelievers. But there is a dispute amongst the scholars. And this issue is known as Halil Kufar. Are the dis- disbelievers مُخَاطَبُونَ بِفُرُوعِ الشَّرِيعَةِ Are the disbelievers addressed in the sub-branches of the religion? Are they being addressed in the branches of the religion? And what we mean by the branches here is that or what the scholars more like mean by branches here is that is the disbeliever addressed when Allah is saying وَأَقِيمُ الصَّلَاةِ establish the prayer are they also being addressed when Allah is saying وَآتُ الزَّكَاةِ 
or they are only being addressed to come into Islam. And all of those are not. The scholars, they've taken two opinions. And in depth and in details, we've dealt with that in our explanation of Al-Waraqat, written by Abu Ma'ali al-Juwayni, rahimahullah ta'ala. So, um, the strongest of those two opinions is that the disbelievers are being addressed. They are also being intended in the branches of the religion. And they will be punished for that. And the evidence for that is the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where he says, مَا سَلَكَكُمْ فِي سَقَرْ قَالُوا لَمْ نَكُمْ مِنَ الْمُصَلِّينَ so when they are asked what brought you into hellfire, what brought you into Saqqara, which is a, a hellfire, what brought you into this place? The response they give is say, قَالُوا لَمْ نَكُمْ مِنَ الْمُصَلِّينَ We were not ones who used to pray. So they were addressed, when Allah was saying, subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَأَقِيمُوا الصَّلَاةِ Establish the prayer, they were being addressed. So when Allah says, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الصِّيَامُ كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ أَيَّامًا مَعْدُودَاتٍ They are being addressed here. But their addressing is not direct as it is for the believers. Their one is after what? تَحَقُّ الشُّرُوطِ الْإِسْلَامِ First cover with the condition of Islam. And then this is needed from you. Whereas the believer, it is needed from him straight away since he has come into thee. Since he has come into the religion. So what I mean by this and the reason I'm mentioning this is because for the believer, you're not allowed to help him in that which is disobeying Allah wa ta'ala. As Allah says in the Quran, ala al-birri wa taqwa wa la ta'awanu ala al-ithmi wal udwan. And the same is that you can't serve the disbeliever food in the month of Ramadan. As much as you're not allowed to serve the believer who is forced and obliged to fast in this noble month, so is the disbeliever. So a believer is not allowed to serve Muslims whilst it is the period of fasting. At night time, it's permissible after, after, after Maghrib and before Fajr. But any time in between Fajr until Maghrib, you're not allowed to serve the believers and you're not also allowed to serve the disbelievers and you're not allowed to feed them because it's a time it's a time when the individual is what obliged to fast based on the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ya ayyuhal ladina amanu kutiba alaykum as-siyamu kama kutiba ala ladina min qablikum la'allakum tattaqun and the statement of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam which he said Buni al-Islamu ala khamsin Islam was built upon five pillars and from the five is what? Siyam Ramadan Fasting in the month of Ramadan and it, by consent the scholars have transmitted that Ramadan fasting is obligatory Ibn Qudama, Ibn Hazm uh, Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Taymi, Ibn al-Mundir and others they've transmitted Ijma'at so that has to be understood so people who own restaurants have to know when it's fasting time that they should try to close their restaurants and they should try to open it or takeaways. They should try to open it after Maghrib or any time before Fajr. Now. This question will be the last question. I'm a sister who's pregnant, and last year I was breastfeed, breastfeeding as well. I've heard many different opinions from trustworthy, reliable scholars here in America. They say I just have to bring back the fasting, and some say, some who say I need to feed the poor. So I'm confused. What shall I do in this particular situation? If the woman is pregnant, or she's breastfeeding and she feels that it's going to become hard on her or she even fears for herself or she fears for her child 
then the Sharia has given her a lead way. It's given her, um, it's uplifted the obligation from her. Now the scholars, they differed with each other on this particular issue in three views. Some scholars who said, Qada is upon her. In other words, she has to bring back that fasting. The second opinion is that no, 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 no. Qada is not upon her, but she just has to feed poor. And the third one is, Fidya and Qada are both upon her on the basis of who did she leave it for. If she left it for herself, then it's Qada. And if she left it for the child and fear for the child, that she's breastfeeding, that he may not get milk, or the child that's in her womb, then they said upon her is what? Fidya. The strongest of those opinion, and that it seems to be strong to me, is the opinion that says that all that is needed from her is fidya. All that is required from her is fidya. The reason is because all the other opinions are based upon qiyas and ra'i, opinions and analogy. Whereas this opinion that says that she needs to pay fidya is based upon textual evidence. And the qa'ida muqarrada in the ulama is what? There is no ijtihad when there are textual evidences. As also the scholars they say, if the river of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is found, there was a man whose name was called Ma'aqal. Ma'aqal used to have a, a Ma'aqil. He used to have a well. He used to have a well. So he would charge the people water. He would take money from them. And when he took money from them, he would make them pay him. And then he would give them the water in return. So if Allah sends rain down, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then little ponds and water stream come, are the people going to go to Mi'qal and ask him for water? Or are they going to use the free water that has come down? They're going to use the free water that comes down. So the qa'idah is إِذَا جَاءَ نَهْرُ اللَّهِ بَطَلَ نَهْرُ مِعْقَلِ If Allah's river comes or Allah's ocean comes then بَطَلَ نَهْرُ مِعْقَلِ Mi'qal is river or lake or pond or whatever he had it's out of the window. What it means is that once the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger come then the opinions that are standing become null and void. Before that we were using it and we were relying on it and it was a source of evidences for us. But the minute that the textual evidences arises, this all becomes something we put aside. And this is something that the scholars, قَرْنًا بَعْدَ قَرْنٍ Generations after generations, they emphasize on that. As Imam Malik said, كُلُّ يُؤْخَذُ مِنْ قَوْلِهِ وَيُرَدْ Everybody statements either taken or rejected. إِلَّا صاحب هذا القبر Except the one who owns this grave, or the one who's in this grave, referring to the Messenger, alayhi salatu wassalam. And an Imam al-Shafi'i, rahimahullah, brought a consensus on this particular issue, which is what? قَدْ أَجْمَعَ الْمُسْلِمُونَ عَلَىٰ أَنَّ مَنْ اسْتَبَانَتْ لَهُ سُنَّةٌ عَنْ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمَا لَنْ يَكُنْ لَهُ أَنْ يَدَعْهَ لِقَوْلِ أَحَدِ That is, by consensus of the scholars, is that if the sunnah of the Prophet becomes clear to you, and then it is not permissible for you in that particular situation to leave it off for the statement of any particular individual, however high and however noble and however virtuous this particular person may be. So this sister, her situation is al fidya She just has to feed poor every single day of whenever she can't fast. And as the Prophet ﷺ said, Inna Allah Ta'ala wada'a shatra salati. 
that Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala uplifted half of the prayer. Meaning dhuhr, Allah lifted half of it, meaning only two is required. So shatr means half. It means nisf. In some of the riwayat of some of the weddings is what? Nisf salati Wasawma anil musafiri, the one who's traveling. The one who's traveling, Allah uplifted from him half of the prayer. So he doesn't have to pray dhuhr for. And asr he doesn't have to pray for. And isha he doesn't have to pray for. He ha- his praise half. وعن المرضع أو الحبلة and the one who is breastfeeding and the one who is who is pregnant. Now these two, which is the one that's breastfeeding and the one who is pregnant, theirs is not that the half prayer is half. No, there is is that the fasting is uplifted from them because another riwayah says إن الله عز وجل وضع عن المسافر شطر الصلاة وعن المسافر والحامل والمرضع الصوم أو الصيام. So the pregnant and the breastfeeding one, what's uplifted from them is the fasting. The fasting is uplifted from them. But they're not the same. The traveler and the breastfeeding and the pregnant are not the same. The fasting person. So the traveling person, sorry, the traveling one, and the breastfeeding, and the pregnant one are not the same, because the traveler, he has to do qada, because it's a delir for him, which is what, وَمَنْ كَانَ مَرِيضًا أَوْ عَلَى سَفَرٍ فَعِدَّةٌ مِنْ أَيَامِ الْأُخَرِ. The one who is a traveler, upon him is to bring back those days which he missed. As for the woman who's breastfeeding, are you with me? The woman who's breastfeeding. And the one that is pregnant and the elderly individual, male or female, very old in age, they have fidya to come with. Based on the statement of Allah, وَعَلَى الَّذِينَ يُطِيقُونَهُ فِدْيَةٌ طَعَامُ مِسْكِينَ Text your evidence. And upon the ones who are what? The ones who it's like on them, fidya tun ta'amu miskin. This is referring to the hamil, the murdi. It's referring to them, and that's the tafsir of Ibn Abbas and the tafsir of Ibn Umar, and it's authentically transmitted from both of them, Ibn Abbas and Ibn Umar. Ibn Abbas clearly said, "Ida khafat al hamil wa ala nafsiha." If the woman who is pregnant fears for herself and also the breastfeeding one fears for her child في رمضان he said يفطراني they break their fast ويطعماني مكان كل يوم مسكينا and every single day they what? they feed a مسكين ولا يقضياني صوما and they don't have to bring back that fasting also, Abdullah ibn Abbas, he saw a slave girl of his who was pregnant for him. And the slave girl who becomes the she becomes the mother of your children. He saw her pregnant or her, her breastfeeding, one of the two. And she was fasting. And he said to her, Anti bi he said to her, you are at the station or you are the ones who those who don't have the ability. Upon you is to feed every single day a miskin. And upon you is not to bring back it. And also Imam al narrated from Ibn Umar. Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Albani rahimahullah ta'ala authenticates it in his kitab Irwa' al-Ghalil he says Bisanadin Jayyidin Albani authenticates this which is that Abdullah ibn Umar and Imra'atahu his, wa- his wife asked him she was pregnant وهي حبلة she was pregnant she said to him do I have to fast? or what's my ruling? or do I have to bring back the fasting? he said to her Aftiri break your fast 
وأطعمي عن كل يوم مسكينة يعني every single day feed مسكين أي مسكين ولا تقضي and do not and do not bring it back you don't have to pay back that fasting now here there's a powerful understanding here which is that first of all we have an ayah from the Quran then we have the understanding of two noble companions and finally something that even makes this opinion to be the strongest and this most is that the speech of Ibn Abbas and the speech of Ibn Umar, both of them is spread amongst the companions. We don't know anyone who opposed them in it. And this, according to the ulama, is known as what? Ijma' sukuti. It's a consensus of agreement and acknowledgement from the other companions. Because the companions are known if they don't agree, if they don't agree with a particular stance of another companion, that they make their stance clear. They show disagreement if they don't agree. But the fact that they went silent and they didn't say any form of disagreement shows that there's a muafaqa on their side, agreement. And this is, as I said, is known according to the usuliyin, Ijma' Sukuti. Ibn Haqqayyim, rahimahullah, in his kitab, Ijma' uh, sorry, in his kitab, Ilam al if you look at it, you find he speaks about this in details. Also, Al Muswadda, written by Ali Taymiyyah, <coughs> it goes into details. And also many other books of usul, they speak about it. So here's an ijma' sukuti we have. We have a consent amongst the companions. And also another thing that makes it even more stronger, which is that tafsir ibn Abbas. Ibn Abbas was a commentary on the ayah, right? وَعَلَى الَّذِينَ يُطِيقُونَ وَفِدْيَةٌ طَعَامٌ مِسْكِينَ Right? He was commenting on that particular verse. And as you know, which is muqarrar, again, it is affirmed and it's established fi ulum al-hadith, in the books of hadith, and also in ulum, you know, fi usul al-tafsir, and we spoke about it when we were explaining the kitab muqaddama fi usul al-tafsir, written by Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyat al-Hardani, rahimahullah. We spoke about it there, which is that the tafsir of a companion, if what he's commenting on has a direct relationship with the verse, then this is given hukm al right? Like a sub nuzul. And that's why Iraqi says in his Alfiyah, وَعَدُّ مَا فَسَّرَهُ الصَّحَابِي رَفْعًا فَمَحْمُولٌ عَلَى الْأَسْبَابِ That whatever the companion's tafsir of a verse is, the ruling is given what? رَفْعًا And of course this is an issue of Iraqi with the issue of Abu Abdullah al-Hakim and Nisa Abu Riyu. And that's another whole issue right there. But the point here right now is that the tafsir of a Sahabi that is connected to a sabab of nuzul, lahu hukm al it has a, it has a hukm al it tastes as though the Prophet said it, alayhi salatu wasalam. It tastes the ruling as though the, as though, as though the Prophet said alayhi salam, he says. So, as I said, the, all the other opinions that are out there, they're all based upon al ra'yu wal qiyas. They're all based upon al ra'yu wal qiyas. والعلم عند الله وآخر دعوانا للحمد لله رب رب العالمين سبحانك اللهم بحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أستغفرك وأتوب إليك